Today we begin a new series, church, called With Us, With Us. We'll be looking at some non-traditional Christmas passages. When we think of the Christmas story, we often think of, we immediately go to Luke chapter 2 or Matthew, first couple early chapters of Matthew. Each week we'll be looking at some non-traditional Christmas passages as we begin a new series today with us. I'm really glad that you have chosen this morning to be with us. My name is Kyle. I'm the pastor here. If we've not met, I'd love to take a moment after service just to say hello to you, answer any questions that you might have about the church. I'm so glad that you've chosen to be with us this morning. Hebrews is the passage we'll be looking at today, the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. We have some Bibles in the back you're welcome to grab, or you can follow along on the screen or pull it up on your device. Hebrews Chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. The scene is the scene before the cameras start rolling when it comes to the Christmas story. Oftentimes, the camera begins with the shepherds out in the field or Mary and Joseph on their way to Bethlehem. But the Christmas story actually begins in heaven. It's the conversation within the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This is a passage often overlooked when it comes to the Christmas story. In fact, some of us may be in there, I don't ever remember having this story told at Christmas time. It's the conversation before Jesus is born. It's the conversation Jesus has with his father in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. We'll look at that in just a moment. There is such power, as we begin this series, with us. There is such great power in presence, in being present, in sitting with someone, in showing up in someone's life, in showing up at a big event, at a a big day in someone's life, you choose to show up. I don't know if there's been a time in your life where you look at a few significant moments and days of your life where it made All the difference that somebody showed up. They sat with you. You don't remember the words they said, but you remember that they showed up. When nobody else showed up, they showed up. The most powerful words, some of the most powerful words we can say to someone is, I'll be there. I'll be there. And the reverse is true, right? recognize when somebody isn't there and the follow-up question where were you where were you I thought you were going to be there significant moments of our life begins right birth if you've had a child it was pretty important that you be there right half the room didn't have a choice in being there the other half right had a choice to be there were you there birthdays holidays in fact, right now, there's probably a number of us in the room having conversation with maybe extended family members who live out of town. Hey, you're invited to come. Are, are you going to be there? I shared with my dad a few, maybe a month ago, I said, hey, dad, our daughter's graduating from college, his granddaughter in a couple of weeks, and extended the invitation, right? You, you try to manage expectations, so this, we're all having these expectations with Christmas, Especially if you're a young couple, where do you go? Do you go to his parents or her parents, right? These are, these are all conversations we've had to figure out, manage expectations. So I invite my dad to her graduation, manage expectations, right? And the next text I get from him is his, his flight time of arrival and departure. He's, he's coming. It's a big deal. My dad's coming. There's been times in all of our lives where We just want somebody to show up. Maybe it began in elementary school when you were sitting at a table all by yourself and someone came up and sat with you at that table. Maybe there was a moment in a hospital waiting room or an ER room where you don't remember what the doctor said, you don't remember what anyone said, but you remember who was there. They showed up. Parents, you get points for showing up your kids' lives. Show up. Be there. Present. Some of the most powerful words is, I will, I'll be there. 
You can count on me. When it comes to showing up in somebody's life, there's usually a cost involved. There's a cost of time. There's a cost of travel. You, you, you have to say no to something else in order to show up in somebody's life. You can't show up in everybody's life, right? But who are the few in your life, no matter what? I remember a moment we were living in Wisconsin, and a few years prior, I was a youth pastor in Kansas City, and a young man who was going through a crisis in his life called me and explained what was happening, and I just felt this overwhelming sense of the Holy Spirit say, get on a plane and go see him. And I didn't know what to say. I remember the whole trip thinking, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. This is, a, this is beyond me. I don't know how to manage this situation. But God made it really clear I had to show up. Maybe you've had that conviction in people's lives. There's been a crisis or something's happening and you show up. With us, presence is a really, it's one of the most powerful gifts we can give to somebody. It's not, it's not money. It's you showing up. Be there. Be able to sit with someone and look at them eye to eye. The next few weeks, we're going to talk about what that means. I believe that everyone, every person on the planet desires for someone to sit with them. On their best days, on those holidays and significant moments of their life, but more than that, on their very worst of days when maybe others haven't shown up. Presence is a big deal. We come to this passage in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. And the conversation is between the Father and the Son. We get an intimate picture. Maybe on Christmas Eve, this conversation's happening in heaven. It's a conversation between the Father and the Son. And this is the conversation, Hebrews 10, verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, these are his words. Did you know that there was a conversation in heaven between Jesus and his father on Christmas Eve? This is what he said. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, this is Jesus speaking, then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now, passage is from Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. It's the Greek Old Testament. In the day that this is being written, most Jews didn't have their... Old Testament in Hebrew. Hebrew was becoming a minority language. Very few people were learning Hebrew. And so they translated the Old Testament into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And so this is word for word from the Septuagint, from the Greek of Psalm chapter 40. Psalm 40 is a whole chapter of messianic prophecies pointing to Jesus. And this is the conversation written hundreds of years before, Jesus having with his Father. Now we're told, let's look at this passage, we're told that in the Bible God is a spirit. In order for a permanent sacrifice to be made, a spirit cannot bleed. A spirit cannot be bruised. A spirit cannot be cut. And so Jesus recognizes to the Father, he says, hey, Father, I know this sacrificial system has not met your ultimate desire. has not satisfied you. And so let me, let me go back. We have two options here to learn about the sacrificial system. Number one, you can read the whole book of Leviticus. Good luck with that this week. Or I can sum it up for you in a few moments. After the temple was established, God says creator of the universe says, I want to dwell with you. I want to be with you. In order for that to happen, your sin has to be taken care of. And so a temporary sacrificial system was established that involved animal sacrifice. Now, all the Israel's neighbors had sacrificial system as well, but it was very different. 
Their sacrificial system was we're going to sacrifice to appease the gods, appease their anger, make sure they don't judge us and get mad at us, and that still happens all around the world today. When I was in Nepal a couple years ago, there's flags. If you've ever seen all these flags, you can't get a picture of the mountains in Nepal without seeing flags. And on all those flags are little prayers written that the gods of the mountains would be good and kind to us. That happens to this day. But the Jewish sacrificial system was the opposite. It wasn't to appease God. God desired out of grace and mercy to be with us. And so he established the sacrificial system. And so what happened day after day after day was the priest would stand. And in order to address the sin of the people, the people were the ones who were corrupt and evil, murderous hearts, isolated. We isolated ourselves from God beginning in Genesis 3. There was a sacrificial system established so that God could be with us. So he wouldn't destroy us. He wanted a relationship with his people. The best way I can describe this, I thought, what is something we do on a regular basis? For us, it's every Monday morning. We roll out our garbage can. There's a day of the week you roll out your garbage can, and it's nasty. And you go around the house and you collect all your garbage. And that, just because I collected it last week, doesn't mean it's taking care of my garbage for next week. It's something that has to be done on a regular basis over and over and over. The garbage of our life has to be dealt with. And when a child sinned, lied to his parents, stole a cookie from the cookie jar, as Hebrew boys and girls, right? A price had to be paid. You imagine the conversations with parents, with their children, about the cost of sin and the weight of sin. Day after day, Hebrews tells us, the priests would stand and they would offer sacrifices. But you know what's better than a sacrifice? Samuel tells Saul in the Old Testament, behold, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Sacrifice is necessary when there's disobedience. You know what's better than a sacrifice when there's disobedience is obedience in the first place. Jesus recognizes that with his father and says, you do not desire... Ultimately, you do not desire sacrifices and offerings, but what you do desire and what you have prepared for me is a what? A body. It's a body. Author John MacArthur puts it this way. There's a side to the Christmas story we rarely tell. Those soft little hands fashioned by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. Why were they made? They were made so that nails might be driven through them and one day the skin of that little cute baby would meet cold steel pressing and causing blood. Those baby feet, pink and unable to walk, would one day walk up a dusty hill to be nailed to a cross. That sweet infant's head with sparkling eyes and eager mouth was formed so that one day man might be forced to place a crown of thorns upon it. That tender body, warm and soft, wrapped in swaddling clothes, would one day be ripped open by a spear. The author concludes, Jesus was born so that he might one day die. This passage in Hebrews 5 and what I described about taking the garbage out every day was a shadow. It was a shadow foreshadowing the ultimate sacrifice that would one day come. The shadow. In the Old Testament, it went before them. The sun was at their back and it laid a shadow before them. For you and I today, that sun is before us and the shadow is behind us. It's the ultimate sacrifice for your sin and my sin was not paid by a shadow. It was the real thing, the real sacrifice. And Jesus says to his father, a body you have prepared for me. The conversation between Jesus and his father in heaven are the marching orders for anyone who has served in the military in this room. Thank you. There was a day where you left home and you were given your marching orders. You were given your mission. This is what is happening in heaven. Jesus is being given his mission. And Jesus has a virtue that no other deity, no other religion has, and this is the virtue of courage. 
Our God has the virtue of courage where he stands before his father, he's given his marching orders, and he takes that first step, that first step's a doozy. He steps out of the throne room of heaven to earth. Why? Because he loves you. His mission was to glorify his father. How did he glorify his father? By coming to you. His mission was to save you. He sees you. He knows every detail about your life, and he chooses to be with you. He, he's crazy about you. He, there's so many opportunities happened while he was on earth that he could have ran the other way. He could have taken a different route. But he submits to his Father in heaven. Now, submission... Kind of an archaic, outdated word, right? In our culture today, we don't talk about submission. Nobody should submit to anybody. Not what Scripture teaches. Within the Trinity, there's submission. Jesus says to his Father, he submits to his Father, I will do your will. Submission does not mean inferiority. There are times I submit to my wife. Ephesians 5 before the marriage tax, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There are times I submit to you. There are times you submit to me. There are times I submit to my children and times they submit to me. We are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There is submission within a trinity. It does not mean Jesus was less God because he submitted to his Father. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Now, it's not the first time Jesus enters earth. At Christmas, it's the incarnation where he, be, he is fully God and he becomes fully man. But there are other moments in the Old Testament where we see Jesus show up. They're called theophanies, where, let me give you a few of them, that you might be aware of some, where the angel of the Lord describes Jesus in the Old Testament. They didn't know it was Jesus, but the angel of the Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D, the angel of the Lord. Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Anytime you wrestle Jesus, you're going to lose. Jesus showed up as in the appearance of a man, as in the form of a man. He was not a man. He was in the appearance. He was an angel. Right? Why couldn't God have sent an angel? Because angels can't die. Right? The only permanent substitutionary sacrifice had to be Jesus once for all to cover the price of your sin and my sin. Other times, the three young men were thrown into a fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. They throw the three in there and they look and there's how many? There's four. Angel of the Lord, Jesus. Jesus was standing in their midst. There are other moments. Joshua runs into the angel of the Lord. Joshua has an encounter with Jesus. It wasn't his first time to earth in Bethlehem, but it was the first time he took on all of humanity. All of humanity was placed on him. It wasn't 50-50. He, he, he wasn't less God by becoming a man, but he was fully man and he was fully God. Christ has existed for eternity. If you're taking notes, first one there is Jesus was. He says, I, I am. I have always been. Sometimes there's a thought Jesus began at Christmas. Jesus has never had a beginning. And he will never have an end. Jesus existed eternally. If you're taking notes, Jesus was. He has existed eternally. Point two, Jesus came. He entered our world uniquely. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you've prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, and we jump down to verse 8. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, Jesus says to his father, behold, I have come to do your will. And what was the will of the God the Father? It was to be with you. The whole point of the incarnation, incarnation is just a, it's a big church word that means God with us, with us, with you. There's never a day, follower of Jesus, there's never a day, there's never a moment where you are not with the presence of God. Your very worst day, everyone else runs away. 
Your very best day, everybody shows up. Your very worst day, everybody runs away. You feel alone. You feel isolated. That's when God says, I want to be with you. I want to spend my time with you. There's no greater joy, Jesus says, than he sits with you on your very worst day. It is us who put the barrier up. Oh, he doesn't want to be with me. He doesn't know what I'm feeling. He doesn't know what I'm thinking. That We put up those barriers, but God says, no, that's when I want to be there the most. I want to be with you, Emmanuel, with us. His mission when he steps out of heaven to earth, his mission is you. That was his mission, to be with you, to sit with you, to weep with you, to rejoice with you, and ultimately to provide freedom for you. This whole series that we're walking through with us, who is this for? This is an unconditional love series. And I believe it's for everyone in the, in the room today as we look at the next three weeks. If there's someone in your life that can relate, let me describe what this series is about. This series, God's Incarnation, is for the discouraged. See if you fit into any of this today. It's for the discouraged. It's for the frustrated. It's for the weary, the disenchanted. It's for the cynical and the empty. Maybe, maybe those feeling alone. It's for those running on fumes, those whose Christian lives feel like constantly running up a descending escalator. It's those of us who find ourselves thinking, how could I mess up that bad again? It's for that increasing suspicion that God's patient with us is wearing thin. It's for those of us who know God loves us but suspect we might have deeply disappointed him. It's for those of us in the room who've told others of the love of Christ, yet wonder if, as for us, he harbors mild resentment. It's for all of us. God desires to be with each and every one of us. Jesus was, Jesus came, Jesus gave. He gave. What did he give? He gave his life as a ransom for you and for me. And he desires to be with us on our very worst day. Dane Ortland in the book, Gentle and Lowly, highly recommend. If you're buying a book for someone who loves Jesus, I highly recommend. It's one of my top five books I've read in the last couple of years. Gentle and Lonely by Dane Ortland. He writes this. Jesus wants us to draw on his grace and mercy because it is who he is. It's not something he does. When he gives us grace and mercy, it doesn't make him more tired. He desires to give us grace and mercy. He drew near to us in the incarnation so that his joy and ours could rise and fall together. Think about that. Compared to the mentality so many of us have, he wants to be with me when I'm good, when I've done something right. When I'm at my very best, that's when Jesus wants to be with me. That's when I feel good about our relationship. No, Jesus wants to be with us 24-7, in the highs, in the lows, at our very worst. That's when he wants to show up. It rises and falls together, his in giving mercy, ours in receiving it. You know what our role is in the relationship? We receive it, Jesus gives it. If you've not received mercy and grace today, Now is the time. Today, just by being here, God says, I love you. I see you. I want to be with you. I care about you. And there's not a day for eternity that I don't want to spend with you. I want to spend eternity with you. The rest of your life and all of eternity. Can you even comprehend eternity? Jesus says, there's not a second I don't want to spend with you. You're like, oh, but you don't know what I've done and where I've been. And Jesus says, no, I, I do. Christ gets more joy and comfort than we do when we come to him for help and mercy. Jesus, he longs for us to come to him in our weakness. He finds joy. We're told in scripture, you know how he endured the cross? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What's the joy? You. 
are the joy. And me, I know. It's not a choice we would make. He chose you to go to the cross for you and for me. It brought him great joy to pay the price of your sin and my sin. If you go down Hebrews 10, jump down to the passage in 16. This wasn't part of the text, but I feel led to share it with you. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. When will he? When? For, forever. Scripture tells us of what's become of our sin. As far as the east is from the west, if I had a globe up here and I start spinning the globe east, I could spin it for eternity and I would never go west. That's how far God has separated your sin and my sin. It says as deep as the oceans are, that's how far he's removed your sin from my sin. We remember our sin. God says, I will remember your sin no more. Why? Because it was paid by the blood of Jesus once and for all. Never needs to be done again. There's a reason our cross, the cross behind me, Jesus is not on it. He defeated death. He paid the price. And that price ultimately was paid in full. In the Old Testament, it was just on parole. We were all on parole. Our sin was not completely covered. Jesus comes, we're set free. And our record is clean. Clean slate for you and for me. All of us, it's set free. Our price has been paid. We bring it up. We remember it. Jesus doesn't remember it. He does not hold it against you. You know what forgiveness is? I will hold it against you no, no more. You're forgiven. If you've not received that today, you can receive that. Complete forgiveness. And it's not just your sins of your past. It's your sins of today. Because God knows we will sin today. And we will sin tomorrow. And Jesus says, covered, paid in full. I will remember them no more. The scene in heaven before the scene on earth. Jesus says, I will go. And why did he go? Because he loves you. Why do we have Christmas? Because he loves you. You were his mission. Mission accomplished. Now with that, Jesus gave, Jesus fulfilled his mission. Now with that, there's a mission for you and I. And that same good news that I just shared about, and the same good news many of us in this room have received, we're not to keep it to ourselves. You and I are given a mission. And that mission is our community, who many of them feel completely isolated and alone. They do not have a friend. They do not feel like they have genuine, authentic community with anybody. What would it look like for us to tell them, no, there is the God of the universe desires to be with you. Desires to say, I'll be there. I'll show up. I'll sit with you. In everything you experience in your life, Jesus says, I will experience that with you. With us. Church, we have an opportunity this next weekend. Here are your marching orders. There's a stack of cards in the back. Some of you are online. You can share this online. You can have a conversation with your neighbors. You can invite them to come here. Not bad news of guilt and shame. We've had enough of that. The message is good news of great joy for our community. Our community is hurting. You don't have to look very far to find people who would love for someone to say, I will be with you. I will sit with you. Here's your, here's your charge, to invite our community Saturday night to Live Nativity. It's outside. It's going to be a great time. But to invite them so that they might hear good news of great joy that our world is so desperately longing to hear. You never know what God's going to do with that. Saturday night, Sunday night. It's not about Live Nativity. Do you hear me? It's about them coming to know Jesus and him desiring to remove all guilt and all shame.
from all of us for all time, for eternity. I'll be praying for you as you consider those invitations that go out this week. I know it takes boldness and courage, but we can have courage. You know why we can have courage? Because Jesus had courage. We do not have a God that cannot relate to us. Jesus had courage so much so he says, I'll go. Father, I'll go. Prepare a body for me. I will go. Would you pray with me? As we pray for this evening, uh, for next weekend. Father, we're grateful for this message. Thank you for the good news of great joy that we can confidently say, for those of us who've placed our faith and trust in Jesus, we can say, we never, ever have to be alone again. We will never be alone. Jesus, you sit with us. You've promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And forgive us when we've pushed you away or forgive us when we have thought we are alone. Remind us, God, of this great gift of your presence that in the middle of the night, you're with us. In the best part of the day, in the worst part of the day, in the difficult times of life, you are with us. I pray that we have an opportunity to share that gift of presence with those in our community, those in our family, that we would share that same love, that unconditional love, and we would show up in the lives of those around us, God, that you've placed. We would be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to say, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. I'll show up because I've been loved. And Jesus showed up for me. I can do that for others. As we come to the altar, Jesus, would you speak to us? Would you lead us? Would we all have sweet moments with you over the next few moments? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.